Hi, and happy Friday. Uh, my name is Melissa Maker. I am here with Clean My Space doing our 17th Clean My Space Live. And I'm so excited this week to welcome a guest who has a really, really unique uh, YouTube channel um, and has quite a dedicated community who absolutely loves her. Uh, her name is Karen Brown, and I'm going to bring her in now. Um, Karen, welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And Karen's a, wel a, a, a welcome. Karen is a fellow Canadian. We both live in, would you consider yourself living in the GTA? Do you? Say oh, yes. You yes. GTA? I'm in North York. I'm in North York. Yeah. Okay, great. So Karen and I both live in the greater Toronto area, and we have met a couple times in person at YouTube events. Um, and Karen, you have such a great story and we can't see it in the background, but maybe uh, for a minute, Chad will boot me out so we can get the full view and see what you do. But Karen, I'm going to let you just spend a couple minutes telling both of our audiences about what you do and how you got there. So I have a channel. It's all about quilting. Um, I guess I'm I'm just coming up to my sixth year anniversary, I think. It's amazing how time flies. Mm. Um, and I've got a lovely community that follows me. Uh, I just, they're so generous and kind. And every time there's some kind of initiative, it's amazing how they just jump in and support each other. Um, it's a delight to be part of it. Um, so quilting. Quilting is, you know, a craft. Uh most people think, oh, my grandmother did that or my great aunt did that or something like that. But it has come back. Uh, it's in the forefront. So many people were making masks uh, that they had all these scraps left over. And there was just this huge cohort of people that have joined the community now. And I came to a YouTube channel because I didn't feel that there was any channels addressing how to use what you actually have. Like, how do you make a comfortable space for you to create and use your stash? Um, and I've really enjoyed sharing knowledge that I gained in managing inventories for years, managing a family of four. And every week I learn something new. It's, it's just been lovely. That's amazing. And yeah, you, you do have to stay pretty organized and on top of your stash of supplies because I've seen your quilting room and You've got quite a lot of equipment in there and uh, sizable equipment. And this isn't um, this isn't something for the faint of heart. Like it's an investment. Uh, it's a it's a labor of love for sure. It takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication. Um, you know, I, I really admire this craft. Before we logged in, Ronit, who works with us, was asking you about making quilts out of, you know, old memorabilia like old kids clothing or sports jerseys and it's just uh it's just so interesting how people will want to form quilts to you know remember different people or different times in their lives it's nice well, that it's nice that you create for them slightly different from other crafts like knitting and crochet where you can make a lot of things just for yourself quilting is very much about making things for others uh I mean, you can quickly do the math. There's only so many beds in your room, in your home. Um, and it very quickly becomes something that you give to other people to wrap them in warmth and love, almost like a protector shield, right? Um, whether they're going through something difficult or whether it be like cancer and stays in the hospital or just going off to university, just holding on to something that's warm and comfortable and you can snuggle into and feel good. Um, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's a nice way to put it. So for anyone who hasn't seen Karen's channel um, and wants some crafting slash quilting inspo more than anything else, or wants to be part of that amazing community, you can join her on YouTube at just get it done quilts. She's at 396,000 subs. It would be awesome if we could get her over 400. I do that see her awesome. silver. Yeah, I do see her silver play button in the background. So that I mean, every YouTuber is so proud of that. Chad has ours up in his office. Uh, of course, they only send you one. So <laughs> 
he will keep those. Um, so Karen, um, the reason why we had you on the show is because you are really big into decluttering. And I think your audience really appreciates that about you because I know we've heard from crafters over the years that it is so easy to build up clutter and find little nooks and crannies to shove things that you think you're going to use one day or another. So we want to get all your tips today. And bef before we get into that, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, if you have any questions at any point, comments, thank yous, compliments, well wishes, you can drop them in the comment box of this live chat. Karen and I are here, but Ronit is checking the comments and she will be popping them uh, into a question feed for both Karen and I. Um, and if you have a specific question for Karen, you can just say, hey, Karen, and Ronit will flag it for Karen. Um, I also want to let you know, um, as we do every week, that we have um, our special Friday sale available over at Makers Clean. Makers Clean is our sister site where we sell all of our premium microfiber cleaning tools and more. Um, so we've got a spring sale going on right now and a couple things I want to highlight. Uh, in the States, we've got our spring cleaning bundle. So let me just tell you what's in there. Regularly, it's 45 bucks. It's on sale for 29. That is a pretty good savings. So you got a five pack of microfiber cloths. You got one original cloth, one maker's mini, one glass cloth, which I have sitting right here. Um, one duo cloth, which is that thick and thirsty double-sided cloth, which I have in my glove box. One waffle weave, which we have all over our kitchen. And then of course, one spray bottle. So that is a great deal. Um, $45 on for 29 and you get a free spray bottle. And in Canada, it's the exact same content, but the regular price is $51. Karen, you know the pain. We all yeah. More than those people in the States. Um, and it is on sale for $29 as well. So you get that five pack plus the free spray bottle. So um, without further ado, we are going to slide right into your questions. And Karen, I'll kick it off if you don't mind. I'm going to get started with Peter Conrad's question, which is what kind of steam cleaner do I use? So this is a good question. Listen, steam cleaning is like a religion. Uh, if you decide that you are going to go the steam cleaning route, you completely invest in it. And once you do it, you're like diehard in steam cleaning. Now, the reason I'm not into it is because for me, like <sighs> equipment, like just the storing of equipment, I don't know, it just feels like a lot. Now, I've tested steam cleaners, uh, Peter. Um, and the ones that I can say that are really good, like Ladybug is a professional brand, Dupre, that is one that everyone knows and loves. Karcher is, you know, available for consumers and then Reliable. Reliable is a Canadian brand that I really like. Um, the reason I like the brands that I listed uh, is because like they are steam specialists. Whereas if you're going with more of a generalist equipment company, I'm not going to name names, but like, you know, the guys that make like vacuums and kettles and batteries and all that stuff, like you're not going to get the same quality. Um, the most important thing in steam is how pressurized they are, how strong the blast of pressure is, because that is going to determine how well they clean and how well they can disinfect a surface. So, you know, if you're going to invest in steam cleaning uh, and you've got the budget, I would say go for um, a great brand. Hey, Cindy, uh, good morning. Good morning. And Josie, Oh, Josie's happy to see you, Karen. That's great. Great last name, Josie. <laughs> and Rachel's there. Hey, Rachel. She loves your wall, Karen. So that's awesome. Karen, why don't you pick up with your question? Um, my first question is from Juniper One, and she's asked, where do I start? And I believe she means, where does she start with her cleaning her craft room? That's an open-ended so, question. Yeah, it's so very open-ended. take it as you will. <laughs> <laughs> so if if you're talking about cleaning, that's different from organizing and that's different from decluttering. So those are three different things. So I would always start with a declutter. And I have a declutter challenge on my website. It's 21 days and it's doable. The main thing in any one of these is not to burn out. Um, we can start in with this ho-ha and have everything out of our cupboards and on a table or in the middle of the room and then realize you don't have the energy to continue and you have a bigger mess than when you started. So use your timer 
Um, I have a dice timer, but you can use one on your watch. You can use one on your phone. And just go in your room and get rid of the garbage. That's the first thing to do. Just go through your space and get rid of the garbage. And then follow the declutter. The declutter challenge is arranged so that you answer as few questions as possible because answering questions leads to brain fatigue. So you want to do all your garbage one day. You want to take out all the stuff that belongs in another space the next day and just work through all the various steps. But that's where I would start with a declutter. Karen, uh, what's a squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> So when any of us are doing anything difficult and you know, because you begin to procrastinate it or, you know, you've got to really psych yourself out to, to get into it, your brain is going to go, oh, but I like this thing over here so much better. Or look, look at that pretty thing over there. Let's do that. And you, it's a distraction. It's a, a game that your brain plays with you. So you don't have to do the hard thing. And now I recognize that these squirrels are popping in because I'm doing the hard thing. And again, I'll bring out my timer and say, you know, you just, you just have to do this hard thing for 15 minutes and then you can move on. But yeah. they're distractions. Yeah, <laughs> they are. I thought it was, I love the way that you position it because I feel like um, on any given day, I have a flurry of squirrels running through my brain as well. So yeah, I, uh, I loved that. Um, yeah, and you bring up a great point. Listen, we have something that we call the three wave system that we use for cleaning. So I'm not sure if you'll find this helpful as well. But, um, you know, I, I maintain that you cannot clean, a, you cannot clean a cluttered space or a messy space. So there's a difference between a mess and clean like cleaning to clean and then cleaning up a mess. So in, in our three wave system, what we do is we delineate between, you know, how you sort of tidy and organize a space, then how you clean the space and then how you finish the space. So wave number one is tidy and organize. Of course, I have a hair in my eyeball, which is making things really comfortable, especially on live. Um, so that's exactly what you're saying about just dealing with the garbage, right? And then wave two is the actual cleaning that takes place, which is, you know, the spraying, the wiping, the polishing, the disinfecting, the dusting. And then wave three is the floors and the garbage kind of, you know, and putting everything back in its final spot and doing any of the finishing touches. So I, I do agree with you that if you have sort of an organized system, um, it really helps you stay focused and on track. Glad we're aligned on that one. <laughs> um, all right. So I've got a question here from Norma Thompson. Uh, and I love this question because this is something that I have to do on a regular basis. And it is, how do I clean my makeup brushes? Um, so uninteresting fact about me, I don't wear makeup unless I am filming YouTube videos or if I'm on TV or of course, if I'm like going to a special event, um, there is a light filter on this screen right now. So if you're all like, wow, how does she have flawless skin? <laughs> maybe I'm not born with it. Okay. Um, maybe it's not Maybelline, but I do have to clean my makeup brushes regularly because you know, it, it deposits color, um, where it's not supposed to, it can, help, you know, it can lead to breakouts and whatnot. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you my system. Um, I went to the dollar store and I got one of those silicone, um, trivets. Have you seen those at the dollar store? Like those silicone trivets? No. You know which ones I'm talking about? No. no. Um, they're, they're like floppy neon colored, um, honeycomb pattern trivets. They're great. And they cost a buck. It, well, buck 25 now. And what I do is I squirt a bit of dish soap on them. I wet the brushes and then I swirl the brushes in the dish soap oh. and agitate on the honeycomb texture. Uh, then I will rinse them underwater, of course, until they run clean. And if, you know, there's still makeup caught in there, I'll, I'll retreat them with that same scrubbing technique. Um, and what's really great about that textured surface, there we go. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. So the one I have would be like that rainbowy looking one, you know, where you got the purple, the blue, the orange, the red, the green, the yellow. Um, that's what mine looks like. Uh, and the reason that texture is so important is because it really helps to provide that agitation. And then I use dish soap because dish soap is a great surfactant. It helps to lift dirt and grease and grime. 
right out of the, uh, the makeup brush. Then I give it a good rinse. Um, and then I take one of our waffle weave towels and I roll the brushes in there just to get any of the excess moisture off. And then I just let them air dry for a while. So that's what I do. I will tell you, I'm considering testing and buying one of the makeup brush cleaners from Amazon, like the ones that you can put in and it spins at a really you know high speed and then you can pull it out and then it spins at a high speed and kind of dries the brushes just to make things more efficient. I'll see. Um, I'm willing to test it, but that's, that's what I do. That's my technique. So I hope you found that helpful. Hi, Mary. Welcome. And good morning, Trey. Is it my turn? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jump right in. So, uh, Heidi Pratt has asked, why is it so hard to maintain your sewing room? So one of the reasons it's hard to ma maintain it is because you're using a different part of your brain in your sewing room. In the rest of the house, like in your kitchen, you're making meals. In your living room, you're watching TV, or but you're sitting on a couch. In a sewing room, you're doing lots of different tasks at once, and you're creating something from something else. So it's quite a different space, and it's also the space where we, we may accumulate more than we need. <laughs> It's, uh, it's it, the understanding the capacity of your space is very hard because you want all the doohickeys and all the latest things and things like that. So it's easy to get too much stuff. And I also um, feel like I, I could see this happening to just about anybody. Like you're somewhere and you see this really cute piece of fabric and you're like, I will use that one day. Oh my God, that would be so perfect if I ever made a quilt for Easter or something. And I like, I don't have the skills that you have. I don't, I mean, I couldn't imagine quilting. It's such a, it, it just requires so much dedication, but I know myself and I would be the queen of fabric cording. So I, I see how easy that is to happen. And your, your sewing space is also a place that you go to relax where there's a lot of function involved in the other spaces and maybe coordinating with others. Um, so you may have to be very disciplined about things there where you can just sit back and relax in your sewing room. Your sewing room is filling your bucket. It's giving you back that, that energy that everything else depleted from you. So uh, you're just, you're just in a different space physically, mentally, and emotionally mm -hmm. when you're in your sewing room. That's such a good point too. Like, of course you want that space to be a little bit more Zen and you have to find a way to balance it despite wanting every single piece of equipment, the newest scissors, um, you know, and, and all sorts of different fabric snippets. But I also know one quilter whose business is so chaotic. Like she has years of samples and supplies on every surface. I said in one video, like the only way that she'd clean up is if she lit a fire underneath it. Like it's, like it's just that <laughs> thick and deep. And even if she she cleaned it all up one week, new samples and things would come in the, the following week. So for her, her sewing room is a place of minimalism. You know, like she just has a she has a very small stash. She has a, an old antique sewing machine and everything is just bare bones because that's where she gets her balance from. Um, right. So it's different people work different ways. You know that it's not working for you when you write a question like, how do I clean my <laughs> How do you clean my, your space? Like you just have too much yeah. at that point. That's, that's a great way to put it. Um, oh, hey, Deb. You know, uh, oh, and Beta, hi, good morning. Oh, it's so nice to see everybody popping in. I like this. Chad's now putting all of our, like, we get to see the comments too, Karen, because just so everyone knows, we're not actually watching the live stream itself. And I also love that people are getting shouted out right here on the screen. That's so awesome. Um, I did want to mention that we have an audience member, one at least one audience member in common, Becky, uh, Becky Ezra. So Becky, if you're here, we were talking about you ahead of time because you sent Chad and I the, the most amazing quilt when Riley was born, our daughter. She was born in 2018 and Becky is from Europe and she sent us a package and it contained what's called a quillow. 
And a quillow is a, fill, uh, a quilt that folds up and tucks away into a pillow. And when you when you open up the quillow, it's got a number of different animal, like quilted animal faces on it. And then on the other side, it's just this really fun, funky fabric. If Chad feels like coming on screen, he can show us um, Becky's. There it is. There it is. Got a kitty. You've got a rabbit. So lovely. A chicken. Maybe that's a little fox. It looks owl. well used. You know what? We it it is it was just the sweetest thing. Like I was so touched. Um, because this is not something that you make, you know, like a card, like, hey, congratulations for popping out a kid. Like Becky obviously, you know, put a lot of thought and heart into this. It was so special. Um just absolutely lovely. And there's the little quillow, the piece that you can tuck and fold everything into. It was just, yeah, Becky, we, we were just so touched. So I just want to thank you. That that was really special. And Karen, um, hi, Andrina. Uh, Karen, you mentioned that Becky is uh, as part of your audience as well. Yes, we were going to meet up uh, back in 2020. Um, but when I was visiting Holland, but unfortunately, all that got um, got canceled. So maybe I can run into you, Becky, this year when I head to Holland. Anyway, Becky, if you're watching, um, thank you. And uh, you can definitely say hi to us in the comments. All right. So I've got a question here from Maria Christina. So I love this question. Why do I choose Dawn over other dish liquid? So if you watch any cleaning content from me or from other uh, cleaning creators, you will see us talk about Dawn. Now, Dawn to me is like the holy grail of soap and sorry, I should say detergent. So detergent uh, is the synthetic form of soap. You can actually only call soap soap if it's natural, like if it's made from fat and ash and all of those ingredients. So um, Dawn is a, is a dish detergent that uh, is made by a company that spends billions of dollars on R&D. Um, they're also a responsible company. I know a lot of people like to hate on PNG. I've worked very closely with them. Um, I've participated in a lot of work understanding, um, their protocols and how they do their testing and, you know, how dedicated they are to environmental responsibility. So I really believe in them, uh, as a company as a whole, uh, and I'm not being paid to say that. Um, but Dawn is just the most concentrated version. Uh, and because there's so much R&D um, behind the product, it just performs better. And when I talk about concentration, this is what I want you to know. When you're buying a cheaper dish soap or a cheaper laundry detergent, um, you're paying for more water. You're not paying for more product. You are quite literally paying for a diluted version of a product. So you are going to have to work harder to compensate for what the product cannot do. Dawn is a concentrated detergent that works well. So if you're looking to get grease off a surface or do a job that a detergent needs to do, you want to choose Dawn. Um, and that's why I always use it. And that's why I always recommend it. So I hope that helps. And fun fact, if your colors ever bleed in your quilt, you throw your, your quilt into your uh, bathtub and then add Dawn. Um, there's a specific formula for it. I think it's a quarter cup to a gallon. Um, and then you add that to the, um, the tub and just keep rinsing your quilt until all the color is gone. It's rinsing clear. No, no way. Yeah. Whoa. You know, I didn't even think of that, but that is, that's a really interesting point. So would you ever recommend that before people start quilting that they launder their fabric that they're about to work with one time just to get rid of any of potential bleeding that might happen? If it depends on the color, if you're working with navies and uh, navy seems to be problematic and red is very red. problematic yeah. and it just red goes back bleeds. to the size of the color molecules, right? Yeah. Um, it may not trigger in the first wash, but it may trigger in the fifth wash. Um, so interesting. So we have, there's a product called color catchers that yes. people use. 
And in quilting, we don't always have to pre-wash our fabrics. You know, when you're making a garment, you need to pre-wash your fabric so that you can get the grain in the right spot and the, the yeah. outfit is draping properly. We don't need to do that in quilting so much. Um, so a lot of people, the first time they're washed is, uh, first time the fabrics are washed is when they're in a quilt. Right. Okay. Wow. I'm so impressed. Dawn just never ceases to amaze me. I know. <laughs> really? It's a miracle product. Yeah, it, it really is. It brings off your dog. It can... <laughs> I know. I know. It's it's really amazing. Um, And we got some lovely shout outs in the comments. Someone said it was their first time seeing, us, seeing me live. So it's nice to be here with you. And uh, someone else said that they love Dawn. I mean, seriously, Dawn's one of those things like once you use it, you can't go back. Um, that's just how I feel. It's definitely worth the extra dough. All right, Karen, I'm going to kick it over to you. What question oh, do you have? We've got one from Janet Vanderwood. She's asking, is there a good way to declutter my scraps? So scraps is something that's common across all crafts. You know, it's just not um, just quilting. And the real thing to think of is before they're created, think about what you're going to do with them. You know, is there, how are you going to consume them in your sewing space? And we all have different answers. Some people don't like sewing with them at all. In that case, you find another crafter who wants to use them and you just keep passing them off to them. Uh, there's other people that will work with them, but just in big pieces. And there's some people that keep the smallest little piece. Um, personally, I don't keep anything under one inch but I have all sorts of scrappy projects that I throw everything into. And I just have, I have a limited amount of sizes. You need a system that is simple because if it's tricky or too complicated, you're never gonna do it. So I have chosen to keep 10 inch squares of fabric, uh, five, five inch strips and two and a half inch strips. And I can do whatever I, there, I have all sorts of different projects that I use those in. Um, some people sort by color. And I think that's just a little bit too much of um, busy work as opposed to there being a, a payoff on that type of work. But that might be the way that you consume them. So think of how you're consuming them and design a way to use your scraps that matches that. That's very and clever. I, I like that you've categorized by size so that you know what I'm keeping versus what I'm not. It's delineated beautifully. Yeah, I was going to say something else and it just oh, and <laughs> evaporated. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, having if if your scraps are accumulating, you're keeping way too many. You know, you want to just think of a, a, a sink and you're just going to keep the sink full. And if it's overflowing, then you need to, you're not consuming them fast enough. Mm. And um, maybe they're not accumulating fast enough either because you're sending too much away. But that's again a personal choice, but they can easily over overcome your space if you don't have a plan. So last year, I took um, my daughter Riley to a uh, mommy daughter. Oh, thank you! Happy Friday! Uh, I took her to a mommy daughter uh, Mother's Day craft uh, event with one of her friends and her friend's mom. And they had scraps of fabric and we were, this was an outdoor activity and they had the moms and the daughters go and find like a big stick. And then we could pick different scraps of fabric and wrap the stick in different scraps. And, um, and then she had yarn and then we wrote little notes to each other. And then we wrapped the notes in another scrap of fabric and then tied it up with the yarn and kind of made like a little fishing rod looking thing. Um, certainly a, a shabby chic craft, but definitely something that was cute. So the point being like there are uses for those small pieces. Mm -hmm. Like the lady just had an abundance of scraps that we could pick from, which was really fun and cool. There were lots of different textures and colors. The kids loved it. Like they really adored it. So, you know, if you have some kids in your life, there are fun crafts that they can do with it too. And another thing that I always love um, is taking, uh, any stuff that I have to Riley's school or her former daycare, like kindergarten teachers live for that stuff. Daycares live for that stuff. So yeah, if you, if you're looking for a place to take your crafty crap that you don't need anymore, 
talk to those people. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to have a look at my questions here. Okay. Oh, this one's from, oh, look, uh, how do you clean the bottom burnt gunk at the bottom of an oven? Okay. This is a crusty question. So, um, my sleeves are already rolled up. This is a big one. So we have a lot to talk about here. If your oven is self-cleaning, this is where I would recommend using the self-clean function. And the best way to do that is to wipe out anything that is easily removable with a damp paper towel, get rid of it because it's just going to singe and burn and stink up your house. Remove your oven racks, take everything off the surface of your range, as well as the warming drawer, take it out. And then you're going to run your self-clean cycle. At the end of that three hour self-clean cycle, you should notice a significant improvement on any of that built up crust. Uh, you're going to wipe it out with just a damp cloth. Like again, you want to use paper towel. You don't want to use a nice cloth. That stuff, um, you know, can be very difficult to, to launder out. Uh, oh, and Chad put up a video, how to clean a self-cleaning oven. Thank you, Chad. We do have that. Um, now, let's say you don't have a self-cleaning oven. Um, it's going to require a bit more elbow grease. Not to say it's not doable. It certainly is. For this task, I like using uh, steel wool. And we're going to use super fine steel wool. So that's the grade marked 0, 0, 0, 0. If you use anything, uh, you know, that's more coarse, you're going to end up with scratches. And we certainly don't want that. Um, now, this part is really up to you if you want to use a commercial oven cleaner like an Easy Off. For me, I'm just so turned off by that stuff. There are just too many precautions. I always feel like, you know, I'm going to be the guy that ends up in the hospital because I used it incorrectly. So I just, I never go there. Um, but, you know, for a job like this, I like a product like Barkeeper's Friend. So you can try Barkeeper's Friend. Um, oh, yes. And we have a video about that too. Thank you, Chad. Chad's, Chad's getting all the videos up there today. Um, so you can check those two videos out, but I would say like super fine steel wool, bit of barkeeper's friend, um, water, you're going to scrub using a circular motion, which is definitely out of the ordinary. Cause I always talk about using the S pattern, but in this case, you really want to agitate and scrub. You're going to have to put a bit of elbow grease in there. Um, but once that's done, you're going to rinse well. Uh, and then you might have to, you know, rinse a couple times cause it, it leaves quite a bit of crust behind, but once that's done, that should take care of the issue. Um, I also find Dawn power wash can be very helpful to get rid of some of that buildup. If you haven't tried Dawn power wash before, um, it's great. I recently used it to clean the bottom of my oven cause I just wanted to give it a touch up. I didn't want to have to do a whole, the whole cleaning. Um, and that was very helpful. Um, oh, Shell, thank you. I like your little black scrub squares. They work really well. Yeah, you can find them on the Makers Clean website. They are double-sided um, abrasive pads, but they're non-scratchy. Um, oh, Wendy says it's 1.30 a.m. in Australia. She can't clean, so she's watching cleaning YouTube instead. So glad we could help you. Um, yeah, so cleaning, cleaning an oven can be challenging. Now, the other thing I'll tell you is this. The easiest way to keep your oven clean is to clean up spills as they happen. So if you know that you had a little bit of a bubble over, deal with it as soon as you pull that food out of the oven when your oven warms. Once it's cooled, it's much harder to clean. The other cool thing that you can do is you can take a bit of table salt. Like let's say you had a bubble over at the bottom of your oven and you see it, you can take some table salt and pour it right on the bubble over at the base of the oven. And what will end up happening is it, the salt will kind of crust all of that spill up and it won't allow it to seal onto the surface. So once you pull your food out, you can then just like remove the crusty stuff, almost like one of those Parmesan cheese crisps. And then it doesn't stick to the bottom of your oven. Game changer. My next question is cheesy 1990. How do you keep your sewing room under control? Well, um, the first thing is to have everything organized and have everything in its place. You want to think about your sewing triangle. You, that's your sewing machine, your cutting board, and your ironing station. And they need to be in a flow. Uh, they can't be obstructed. You, don't, you can't be jumping over boxes to get to your ironing board um, because that just... Anytime anything's difficult, chances are you'll avoid doing it. So if it's difficult to put away your fabric, chances are you're not going to put it away. If there's no place for your tools, 
then your tools don't go away. So think about that organization. I have a series on organizing your sewing space and you want the, the tools that you use every day within hands reach. You don't want to have a, have them in a closet or in a drawer or anything. They've got to be just reaching out your hand and grabbing them. Then the things that you use every week, they can be like one movement away. Like they can be in a drawer or you got to stand up and reach a count, uh, a shelf or something like that. And you just work out, you know, the tools that you only use once a month, they can be a little bit farther away. The tools that you only use once a year, you do have to question why you still have them, but, uh, but those go farther away. And the same with your fabric. You don't need your fabric right next to your sewing machine. That can go in that secondary uh, storage space. So start with the bones of your sewing room and make everything easy to put away. Yeah, that's great advice. And and it, it, it's so fitting, like for any space in the house, um, you know, the things that you use more often, make sure that you have them more accessible, the things that you use less, frequent, re, less frequently, question them. And if you really need them, uh, make sure that they're in a space that's still accessible so you don't forget about them, but it's not like getting in your way and kind of cluttering things up um, in but general. You might have this with uh, some of your people as well, your community. There's this myth of the, the magical, mystical container that's gonna solve all your problems. Mm -hmm. And people often get into the situation because boxes in, are so cute and adorable. Some of them you end with a container inside a container, inside another container, inside a drawer. And that is so hard to put anything away in that type of situation. So, yeah, it yeah, it's like container inception. And the other thing I'll say is like people think that buying containers is going to solve all of their organizing woes. And the truth is you declutter first then you think through your system, then you buy your containers. Like the containers have to come last um, and you buy them if and only if they make sense for the space. So yeah, I think it's very tempting and very like, you know, easy to buy what looks cool on Instagram, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for your space. The most important thing, the most customized thing you can do is just think through your space and the flow of your space, what you need, what you don't need, um, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And like what makes sense for Karen might not make sense for you in your sewing room. Um, so very true. It's worth thinking through. All right. Here's a question from Mary. I donated five big bags of things. I no longer want more to go and one day at a time. So I, I have to say, Mary, kudos to you. Um, there's almost nothing that feels better than dropping stuff off at a donation site that you no longer need. Um, I feel like Chad and I are just on the brink of having to do that in our house. I mean, our daughter is big now. She just turned six. And let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff that made sense when she was two and three that's still rolling around our house and we need to do that declutter. Um, and frankly, I can't wait to have that, that feeling, that relief. So Mary, you've inspired me. And uh, I hope that you've inspired a lot of other people today with that comment. Good for you. That is awesome. Make sure you know where your bags are going to be dropped off because yeah. I'm sure other people will say we we can ride around with them in the back of our car for five months before we actually make get them out there. Longstanding Instagram joke about that. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the meme that floats around about that, but it's like, let me just put these donations in my trunk so they can sit in my trunk for a year before I actually drop them off. Oh, look at this nice message from Janthi. You ladies are rocking, beautifully bouncing off each other. Oh, thank you. That's really sweet. That is. Uh, all right, Karen, you take this one. Um, Butterfly Me says, how do I manage my craft supplies when I live in a small space? Um, everybody is looking for this magic pill of how you can fit all the stuff into a small space. And the key word is capacity. Your room can only fit so much and you have to decide how much space things are going to take up, whether it be a bookshelf or containers that go underneath your bed or whatever. And that's all you can keep. It is um, a limiter and it doesn't limit necessarily your crafting. Um, limits and limiters and just control some variables can produce some really excellent art. 
So just think about how much can fit in there. And that's all you get. That's the only space that you have. And you know what I really liked before we um, hopped on live, Karen, you were talking about how everything you have is on wheels. Yes. Yes. Which and helps a lot. Yeah. And, and you know, what's cool about it is like, if you have a table or, you know, a desk, you can slide, like you can slide your storage in and out and around and kind of stick it in different places. Um, so yeah, just those clever storage solutions that make sense. I find, I find, you know, living in a small space, it, it can feel limiting, but it also makes you be so much more mindful and clever of how you use your space. Whereas when you live in a larger home, you can get, you can get lazy and sloppy about it. Yeah. And you end up valuing what you have. If you carefully curate your items for what fits in, you know that you love everything that's there. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Okay, so I've got one here from Lisa. Good afternoon from the UK. Hello. Um, I missed the start, so I don't know if this has been asked. How do you get started decluttering a wardrobe full of clothes that don't fit? Emotionally, I'm finding it hard to start. Yeah, Lisa, I find this a, a good question. And, you know, one of the lives, one of the first lives that we did was with Cass um, from Clutterbug. And she used a term that I will never forget. She called those clothes bullies. And once you start thinking about them like bullies, you will realize that they just don't make sense in your closet anymore. So let me expand on that a little bit. What she said was, if you open your closet and every time you do, those pieces taunt you, you know, and they're like, oh, remember when I used to fit you? Remember that time that you wore me out and I looked great on you and now I don't fit you anymore. Like I have clothes in my closet that look like that. Um, you're looking at a perimenopausal woman right here. Um, yeah, my jeans from a couple of years ago aren't fitting the same way. And I have some bullies hanging up in my jean closet that I'm feeling in a little bit of denial about right now. Not loving that for myself, not loving that journey. But the truth is, uh, Lisa, that's what you have to do. You have to say to yourself, what, what is the emotional tax that I am paying right now on these clothes? Um, your closet, you know, Karen just used a word about, uh, she's, she just used a word about a small space and that was curation or, or be, you're curating your space. And like your closet, your clothing should be the same way. You should feel so much joy when you open your closet or your drawers. It should just be full of stuff that looks great on you, that fits well, that flatters your body, and that's easy to piece together. And if it's not, then it's time to move on from those pieces, no matter how expensive they were, no matter how much you used to love them, no matter how great they used to look on you. Like when I come across clothing like that, it's just, I can't, I can't give it any more um, emotional space. In fact, having this conversation uh, is making me um, realize that I need to, um, I need to get rid of some of those jeans because they are, they are quite literally taking up a lot of space in my closet right now. Um, and they are making me feel sad. They are bullies. Those jeans are being bullies to me right now. So um, glad I got a chance to share that with you, Lisa, and be vulnerable with the community. But it's true. That's what's going on. And there's those aspirational outfits too, you know, like yeah. when I do this, then I'll do this. Then I, and then, yeah, like when I lose 10 pounds, yeah, the when I lose 10 pounds crew, yeah, we all have that crew in our closet, don't we? <laughs> I actually find it in my jewelry drawer. Like, oh, really? I, I just keep thinking that I'm going to be able to put on all these big earrings and necklaces and things like that. And <laughs> I never have. <laughs> I just got to go. deal with it. There you go. Uh, okay. Twix. 12 and 20 says, when I process my batting, the fiber dust can get overwhelming. Can you recommend an air purifier for fiber dust migration? I have this problem too. So for people that don't know about quilting, batting is the stuff that goes in between your top fabric and your bottom fabric. And it used to be made out of a crazy variety of things. Um, but now most of it is, is cotton. And there's some that is a mix of cotton and poly. Some is just poly. There's bamboo, there's wool, and there's silk. So I found that I could no longer use the 80-20 cotton poly 
because the fibers were coming off and just affecting my eyes so much. Um, I now just use 100% cotton and that's what I use. Um, I don't have any air purifiers that I can recommend, but maybe Melissa's got one. Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, completely biased. I love Dyson. I think everyone who watches Clean My Space knows that. Um, but Dyson, to me, make the best air purifiers. Um, they are uh, like their quality is incredible. This the screen on the air purifier, the app will tell you exactly what it is picking up in your air, how clean your air was when it started, how clean it was when it was done. They're easy to maintain. They're amazing quality. They last for a long time. Big fan of that. I also want to say, if you're noticing that you're getting that, a really good uh, practice is just to vacuum afterward. I imagine, Karen, um, from someone who doesn't have a sewing room, that it gets quite dusty in there quite quickly. So uh, regular vacuuming would be really important. Yeah, it's amazing how the dust even moves out of your room into other spaces as well. But uh, your cloths would, is, are just amazing to pick up all that that uh, fine, fine dust. Oh, thank you. Thank you for a Maker's Clean plug. Just a little reminder, everybody, we're having um, a spring cleaning bundle sale over at the Maker's Clean website. Thanks, Karen. Um, in the States, we've got our bundle regularly $45 on for $29. Um, you also, it's a five pack of microfiber cloths plus a free spray bottle. In Canada, the price point is $51 on sale for $29 plus the free spray bottle. Um, you can visit makersclean.com or makersclean.ca. I will also mention that if you're not buying something that's on sale, you can always use the code YouTube10 to save 10% off your order. Um, I've got a question here from Trey. Uh, Trey says, hey, Melissa, I might plan on getting rid of half the squeezy throw pillows that I still have. They have dried fabric paint on them. I might need boxes to donate the pillows. So my other half is in my closet. What would I need to wrap up the pillows? Would I need any kind of paper and what kind specifically? So Trey, this is a cool question. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to tell you something about pillows in general. Um, People, generally speaking, you're, you're not donating pillows. Like people don't like to take them. Um, bedding, uh, comforters, pillows, blankets, towels, that kind of stuff is best off going to a pet shelter. Um, so to answer your question, I wouldn't actually worry about how you package it up as long as it's relatively clean. Uh, any pet shelter or um, a pet rescue would be delighted to take that and it would become a cat or dog's new best friend. So I hope that helps. Cindy Potter has mentioned that she can't function in her sewing room if it's messy. She did the declutter in 2023 and found that this year there was nothing really new to have to do. And Whoa. it's interesting how you do the declutter year after year because you're not decluttering the same stuff necessarily and you get to talk about other whether it be aspirational or bully items that are in your in your space but congratulations to you Cindy not having to declutter much this year that means you're doing the right you're doing the right things yeah goals that is amazing uh honestly like not, what could feel better than that um yes Linda Bullies. I love it. Linda pointed out some bully items for her. We've got to thank Cass for that language. That was totally her. Okay. Nicholas Hackett. I got a shampoo bottle. Uh, I got a shampoo from 2018. It's full, but out of date and has to be emptied for recycling. How do I get rid of it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the right way to get rid of it is to take it to your hazardous household waste uh, drop site, uh, in your local community. So, um, where I live, you can just go online and you can say, you know, where do I take my hazardous household waste? And you might be thinking, why would shampoo be considered that, you know, when we're using it on a one-off basis to wash our hair, that's one thing. But when you have a full bottle of it and you're trying to get rid of it, um, it's not great for the water. It's just more work to get rid of. So, if you take this to a hazardous household waste dump site, they will have a responsible way to get rid of it for you. 
I know it's extra work. You asked me for the right way. I'm telling you the right way. So I hope that helps. What happens to shampoo when they get out of, when they're past their best buy date? So, you know, it's not, it's not like it's going to make your hair fall out, you know, or it's not like it's going to turn green. Really what ends up happening is with a lot of these cosmetic products is they might separate. They might start smelling off. Um, the components, the way that they were supposed to work might not work as well as they should have, but it's not like you would experience any negative side effects necessarily. It's more that the product is not going to perform as the company intended necessarily. So when you see a Best Buy date, it usually says, you know, Best Buy for a reason because they want you to use it by that date. In fact, I was just at a shop. There's a little um, place in Turks and Caicos. I was on a vacation there. Um, there's a little skincare company where this lady, she's so amazing. Like she grows flowers on the island and then makes skin and body care products from the extracts of those flowers. And her products have a best buy date. And I went into the shop to get my skincare product that I like, uh, which I get every time I go. And she had like bottles of baby soap and um, skin cream. She's like, these are expiring next month. They're free. Take them. Because she just, she didn't want to toss them, but she wanted to make sure that they got used because uh, her products, you know, unlike something that has more synthetics in it, they're all natural. So they had to be used by their best buy date. Okay. Um, Renee Smith has asked, is there any way of re-sewing holy socks? I don't think she means that in the, uh, the religious <laughs> way. I think she means there's a hole in the toe. Which stitches would be best for cotton socks? Um, there's this whole new movement. I shouldn't say new. It's a revival of what is called visible mending. So I've seen this. It's really pretty. Well, one of the big people is also here in Toronto. Her name, uh, her tag name on Instagram is Boohoo. I believe it's B-O-U-H-O-U. -U. She's written a book about it, and she shows thousands of different ways to mend things and if you're talking about a hole it may ne not necessarily be a hole if it's brand new it's just one thread is missing and you can use um just take a matching thread you want it slightly heavier maybe if it's a dress sock um same weight if it's like a woolly sock and you're just connecting the loops both top and bottom but take a look and just google visible mending and you'll see what you need to do I uh, I remember seeing I want I want to say it was in like a real simple magazine, and I saw um, I think it was like patches on a jean jacket or something, and it was like this lady chose um, like a, a high contrast color, like maybe it was like neon pink or something, and she did these beautiful stitches, and it it made the piece look entirely custom, like it went from being something that she would have tossed to looking so cool, and it's in moments. Like that where I'm like, I wish I knew how to sew. <laughs> the last time I, the last time I learned how to sew was in grade eight when I or eighth grade for you folks in the states, um, when uh, home economics was still a thing, which we all know is not, which is why both Karen and I have YouTube channels. Um, here's something from Beta Believe. Melissa, I've been watching you for almost 10 years. Wow. Hi. So you've seen me age. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing you live. This is so nice. You've helped motivate me so much. Thank you for everything you do. That is so nice. Thank you so much for that uplifting and very kind comment. Um, I really appreciate that. And it's nice to be here um, after all these years talking about a, a topic that I really hate. Um, <laughs> but I know, um, I know in that hate, I've been able to help both myself and so many other people too. So um, yeah, lovely, a lovely comment. And thank you very much. I've got Deb Curran saying, I always take 10 minutes after a day of crafting to put everything away, e even if I'm continuing tomorrow. That's a very good point. Um, people often ask how I'm able to create so much. And that step right there is one of the reasons. Before I get too tired, I always organize and plan what I'm going to be doing the next day. And I've just realized <laughs> this week, it's amazing, 
how long it's taken me to figure this out. But I also need prep time to prepare. There's a there's actually an additional step ahead of that. So that's often easy for me to do at night where it's not necessarily easy for me to do during the day. Just It's just basically kind of loading all the information into your brain so that you can prep, uh, prepare your stuff for the next day the right way. You know, I often find like um, with cleaning and it sounds like with quilting as well, it's it's like the, the mise en place with uh, any chef that you meet, you know, when they're like the amount of time they spend cutting the onions, the celery, the carrots, and, you know, all of the stuff they have to do to have everything ready and in place so that they can be efficient when they're working. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, the um, the worst part about cooking is the cleanup that happens after, but it's also a very important part. So, yeah, we can learn so much from cooking, can't we? Uh, okay, I've got a question here from Renee Smith. Hey, Renee. Um, I know uh, Renee has been around for a while. So how do you handle heavy automotive greasy slash oily clothes? My husband works uh, in a factory. Should I pre-treat his clothes as soon as he gets home? I only wash his work clothes once a week. Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, and you know what's funny? I've seen, I don't know if you've ever seen the hack where people use a can of Coke in the washing machine. Like people do some weird things with Coke. Um, but people say to put a can of Coke in the washing, like in your um, drum uh, like empty the can, um, like the contents of the can. So I just want to be really clear about that. Yeah. Um, and then you can use that to launder, um, along with regular detergent. So this is what I would do very honestly. We talked about this earlier, um, the importance of having a good quality detergent. So Dawn is like, Dawn is a surfactant. A surfactant is, um, as a synthetic, it's like a chemical or, you know, a, uh, it, it, it's, it's essentially its job as a chemical compound is to lift dirt off or grease off a surface. So that is all you want. You want a surfactant. You want the thing that is designed to do the exact thing that you need. So Dawn, if you can take some Dawn and pre-treat any of those greasy spots, those oily spots, um, that's going to be great. You can pre-treat it. You can scrub it in with like a little cleaning toothbrush. Uh, you can run it under, um, some water. Uh, so you can use hot water actually. So, you know, we have to be very careful with hot water and cold water when we're treating stains, but I want you to think about it like this. Grease is like butter, right? So when it's heated, uh, it's more malleable and it's easier to get rid of when it's cold, it's harder to get rid of. So when we want to get rid of grease, we want to use a surfactant and then we want to use hot water. Um, the other thing you can use as a pre-treater is, a good quality laundry detergent. So again, I'm going to go with, with Tide, like a PNG product. Again, just going back to the R and D, the quality of the product, it just, it just works better. Like I, I mean, I know I sound biased. I, I love the product, but I've just tested so many other ones. It just works. Um, so a product like OxyClean is not really going to help you in this circumstance because OxyClean um, is going to lift color stains. That's its job. So OxyClean bleach, that stuff's not going to help. That's not going to solve your problem. Your problem is grease. You need a surfactant. Lots of info, but I hope that that gave you a bit of background. Um, and now you can confidently approach those stains, Renee. Okay. Oh, hey, Haiti. Hey, Madeline and Francis. Oh, from Spain. I hope I can visit you in Spain one day. We get so many, so many lovely comments from all around the world, Karen. Isn't that a fun part of creating YouTube content? I think it's amazing. You got, you have Jayanthi Roa here and she, or he, sorry, I don't know who recognize whether it's male or female, um, has been a longtime supporter of my channel. So just oh. love to see people here from all over. Yeah. I, I wish I had the map of the world during these lives and I could put yes. in where everybody's from. Yeah, you could see the different pins. I know. I, I think about that too. It'd be so nice to see like a heat map of where our audience is from. Karen, it's been so much fun uh, having you on the live. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing. You've provided so much help and insight to people. Um, I want to. Well, Thank you for having me. Find you. Oh, 
Our pleasure. Please remind everyone where we can find you. Um, you can find me on my website, uh, justgetitdonequilts.com. Uh, truly, you can just Google Quilts Karen Brown and my YouTube channel and everything else will come up. I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Just Get It Done Quilts. And there is my channel right there. Nice. And you sell patterns uh, on your on your website as well, right? I don't sell patterns. Uh, oh. The only merch in my store are mugs that say Just Get It Ooh. Done. Well, we like a mug. We always like a mug. Okay, that's great. Um, and uh, for everyone else watching who loves Makers Clean, just a quick reminder, you can go over to makersclean.com or if you are in Canada like Karen and I, you can go to makersclean.ca where things are in Canadian dollars, which makes things so much easier, doesn't it? Um, you can get our spring cleaning bundle right now in the U.S., um, it's regularly 45 bucks on sale for 29. You get a five pack of our microfiber cleaning cloths. You've got one of each type that we have plus a free spray bottle and people are loving that spray bottle. We spent a long time finding a good spray bottle. This one's a great quality one. And in Canada, that kit goes for $51, but we are also putting it at 29. You get a five pack plus a free spray bottle. Uh, and if there's anything on the Makers Clean website that's regularly priced, whether you're on makersclean.com or makersclean.ca, you can always use the coupon code YouTube10 to save 10% off. Um, and with that, I will bid everyone farewell. And I'll see you next Friday uh, right here on the Clean My Space channel where we do another live and bring on another very special guest who is happy and willing to share their cleaning knowledge. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. And thanks again, Karen.